Hello and welcome to episode five of the Military Poetry Vlog. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Hodges. Um, you've just skipped 12 minutes of sponsorship, so I'm going to do the sponsorship messages. Four episodes we were sponsored by Skull Crusher Coffee, Death Before Decaf. We don't have any more sponsors apart from Morrison's supermarket in the UK, Peppermint Tea, which is what I'm drinking as it's late at night and I do not need caffeine. The other sponsorship money, uh, message, money, message, is on behalf of Corner House Antiques and Antique World Manchester, both to be found in Fellsworth, Manchester, M359BS. Um, great antique shops. I'm going to do a Militaria and bookstall there fairly soon. Um, they've been seen on the Channel 4 programme Posh Porn Brokers and on the BBC One famous afternoon daytime show, Antiques Roadshow, a uh, road trip. No, not the road show, that's the big pick area. And there's also a celebrity version of Celebrity Antiques Road Trip, which I think is probably evenings on BBC Two. And anyway, um, great antique shops with me in it selling stuff like um, 1950s OO gauge railway, um, a few modern toys, a few modern children's books, uh, a lot of high end literary fiction, which is what I read, mostly in hardback, and lots of history books. Again, um, Lots of paperbacks, lots of hardbacks, mostly First World War, but a huge amount of Second World War as well. Um, First World War stuff, I have more or less every memoir that's ever been published on the First World War, because um, I collect them. Um, so the ones I don't have, I either haven't read yet, or I'm looking for a really good price for, because they're really rare. I guarantee, this is a promise, I will be cheaper than Aid Books, which is run by Amazon, and cheaper than Second Hand on Amazon. If you find an item cheaper on eBay, Amazon, or eight books, I will refund the difference and give you two pounds sterling. Okay, that's my guarantee. Um, toys, I guarantee against um, a burnout essentially for a year. Um, if you break them, that's that's your own bad luck. Uh, OA gauge railways are pretty strong. Scale electrics, which I also sell, is pretty strong apart from the brushes, which are obviously replaceables. Um, uh, also, the other sponsors are Apple with a lovely second generation iPad Pro, which I've just looked up the poet Homer on, who we're going to hear some poetry from. So let's get an introduction to Homer. He's an ancient Greek poet, um, or presumed author of the Iliad and the Odyssey, two epic poems that are the central works of ancient Greek literature. The Iliad is set during the Trojan War, the ten-year siege of the city of Troy by a coalition of Greek kingdoms, um, focusing on the quarrel between King Agamemnon and the warrior Achilles, um, yeah, which uh, takes place a few weeks during the last year of the war. Uh, the Odyssey, which we're not going to hear from tonight, um, uh, that's the translation by the Poet Laureate in Britain, Simon Armitage. Um, we're not going to hear the Odyssey tonight, that's the, the ten-year journey home of Odysseus, king of Ithaca, after the fall of Troy. So there are accounts of Homer's life that circle, circulated in the classical antiquity, um, and these are all sort of rumours, I suppose, but um, they all agree that he was blind, uh, he was a bard, and he was from Ionia, which is central coastland of Anatolia in present-day Turkey. So he's known as an ancient Greek poet, but in fact he was an ancient Turk. Um, but we changed and changed it, obviously. These are legends. Um, the Homeric question concerning by whom, when, where and under what circumstances the Iliad and Odyssey were composed is a debatable one. Um, one says that most of the Iliad and the Odyssey are works of a single genius poet. The other view is that they're a result of an oral tradition working through and reworking by many contributions contributors, and Homer is uh, just a label for our tradition. Um, it's generally accepted that the poems were composed at some point around the late 8th or early 7th century BC, and they're in Homeric Greek, also known as Epic Greek, a literary language which has Ionic, Ionic Aeolic dialects uh, from different centuries, and mainly is Eastern Ionic. Obviously, these were transmitted orally. I don't think anyone disagrees with that. Um, and they weren't written down, you know, like, like uh, most of the Old Testament um, until later, later, you know. We don't have um, the equivalent of the Dead Sea Scrolls for, um, for Homer. That's probably enough about Homer. You can go and check him out. On the other sponsor, uh, 
Apple iPads and Wikipedia. God, that's a lot nicer than the Encyclopedia Britannica as I remember from my youth. I did used to write for the Weber Encyclopedia and get paid for it. That's unheard of now, I would imagine. Um, right, let's switch off the iPad. Else, ooh, the batteries don't last forever, even on Apple Kit. Wish they'd sponsor me. Um, uh, now, for fair play, I have to say that Simon Armitage is published by the most famous poetry house in the uh, UK, Faber and Faber. I'm quoting from it under fair usage. Um, if they want to sue me, um, email me on pdhodges at gmail.com. I'm only going to do a few from the first pages of the last day of Troy, days of Troy, Homer, translated by the British Poet Laureate, Simon Armitage. I'm not going to read the introduction because I've done that. Let's crack on with the poetry. Um, do I need to introduce the characters? He does it first. I'll introduce them as they arise, I think. I'll refer to that should I need this. So this is Act One, Scene One. Present day Troy, the archaeological and tourist site of Hisali, Turkey. Spray painted in gold and impersonating a statue, Zeus, Zeus, the king of the gods, stands on a wooden box with a collection tin at his feet and a sign saying Zeus. Behind him, on his small cart, are souvenirs and trinkets from the story of the Iliad, including action figures in the shape of Achilles, the main Greek hero, warrior, Agamemnon, the king of the Troys, Priam, um, oh no, I've got that wrong. <laughs> Start again. Agamemnon is the commander of the Greek forces. I've forgotten the poetry myself. Priam is the king of Troy. Et al. So this is written like a play, and we start off with Zeus, who is furious. Rage, goddess of memory, draw from my throat the story of Achilles, son of Peleus whose wounded pride brought suffering and misery to his own comrades, sent the souls of warriors to the land of the dead, till the battlefields of Troy were scarlet with blood, and by day crows scavenged on lips and eyes, and at night dogs feasted on the limbs and innards of lifeless bodies beneath the stars, all under the watch of almighty Zeus. Conjuring my mind, the moment it began, when words flew between brothers in arms and a feud was born. Tired and unappreciated, he stepped down, steps down from the box and takes a drink from the bottle of water. Once rested, he goes to the cart and picks up a few of the action figures, staring at them, considering them. And begins to arrange them on the box like a boy playing with toys, toy soldiers. Zeus again. <sighs> Ten years into this most gruelling of military confrontations, and we're still no closer to any kind of resolution. A decade ago, leaders and warlords from almost every kingdom in Greece mobilised a task force of thousands of men, sailed east, pitched camp on the shore and laid siege to the walled city of Troy on the far bank of the Scamander River. Motive? Vengeance. Objective? Return Helen to her rightful country and lawful husband. Progress so far? Nil. Current situation? Stalemate. With neither Greeks nor Pro Trojans prepared to surrender an inch of ground or contemplate defeat. On one side, under Agamemnon's command, conditions in the Greek base are squalid and the morale of homesick and weary men impossible to judge. On the other side, resources are running low and nerves are threadbare in King Priam's besieged citadel. It's hard to see this concluding without some all-out catastrophic battle, an endgame or finale, like a great storm that clears the air when it comes, may the gods have pity on those who hear its thunder. But until that time, dark clouds mass overhead. 
the immovable object holds firm against the irresistible force and this terrible war. Drags on and on. All right, what is the time? It is late. Um, and that is 10 minutes of poetry. I hope it's whetted your, whetted your appetite for scene two of The Last Days of Troy, translated from Homer by Simon Armitage. And it goes very play, scene two. And that will be War Poetry Vlogs, episode seven. So look forward to some more great Iliad-based Homeric poetry in episode seven. And it concludes to me to say thank you to Peppermint Tea and Corner House Antiques and Antique World of Manchester for sponsoring this short episode. If you want to see uh, more sponsorship messages and general blurb from me, then the, the uh, episode 5A is uh, you, you might have skipped. Uh, don't know if you want to hear anything about antiques and stuff. Don't skip it. Go back and um, uh, look forward to seeing you for episode 6. Um, which I'm going to read, um, uh, Young Poets of the Second World War. Okay, uh, so um, yeah, uh, I don't know whether I'll do that tonight. I um, probably won't, it's, it's too late. I shall upload 5A and 5B and look forward to your company for six tomorrow in sunny Manchester. Over now. <laughs>